The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Nova's presentation. I failed my 2023 ADP test. What can I do for 2024 with Steve Vest? Before we get started, I'd like to point out the panel that's on the right-hand corner of your computer screen. You will see a drop-down section for chat. This is where you're going to enter in any questions that you may have for Steve. Feel free to submit your questions at any time. If time runs out and you still have questions, uh, please send them to our email address, webinars at novo401k.com. Right below chat, you will see handouts drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you are with us today to earn uh, continue education credits, please be sure to stay until the end to fill out our pop-up survey. This is gonna allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who have met the time requirement. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova 401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you so much for joining us. I would now like to introduce for, uh, Nova's VP and shareholder, Steve Best. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, if uh, you if you're on this webinar, then uh, we invited you because uh, per our uh, records, your plan failed what we call the ADP test. And uh, we want to give you some possible solutions on how to solve that problem. Um, first, a little disclaimer that this, is, uh, this webinar is not intended to be tax advice or legal advice. And if you need such advice, please consult the appropriate attorney or accountant as, as needed. Also, if you need CPA credit, uh, our provider number is 009820. You need to register individually and be here for the whole webinar. Return the evaluation form and then you'll get a certification within a week. So a little introduction and agenda. Uh, first, we'll just introduce, you know, what is the average referral percentage test? What are some of the other tests and functions that NOVA provides for you? Uh, get into some of the solutions of ADP testing. We'll talk a little bit about safe harbor plans. That's one way to sort of avoid this type of testing. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, some additional services and mid-year testing that we can do that are not necessarily required, but can be very useful in, in determining how you're doing uh, during a particular year uh, and whether you might be passing or failing for the upcoming year. And then uh, what kind of amendments and testing elections can be made to help uh, resolve some of the testing and ADP failures. So I really want you to understand, number one, what is the ADP test? We'll go into that in a moment. Uh, how are refunds actually calculated? Because I know from time to time, participants and even you know plan administrators, sponsors like yourselves are wondering, well, I understand people are going to get money back, but how does that actually work? You know, who gets it? Why do they happen to get it the way they do? Um, then be able to understand some of the options that are available that uh, might be able to minimize some of these refunds. And then uh, talk a little bit about some more safe harbor designs that can be adopted to avoid the testing altogether. I always like to start out as well with this chart of roles and responsibilities. Uh, just to explain, number one, what does NOVA do for you? And then what kind of a service model you're actually using? So we call this an unbundled model. But in any 401k arrangement, there's basically four distinct roles and functions that have to be played by someone. Okay, uh, The plan sponsor is your company. You're the company that decides you want to have a 401k plan. You have the overall fiduciary responsibility. And your primary uh, responsibilities include making sure that all the elections that people make in terms of what they want to contribute get into your payroll system properly, and then that you're actually sending those contributions over to the investment provider in, in a reasonable amount of time, which is usually three to five business days. Okay, so enrolling your folks uh, is part of your, your function, offering the plan on time. The investment provider obviously is uh, the, the company that you partner with to provide the investments, the online uh, access, the 1-800 number, 
um, they actually are the custodian of the money. That's where all the cash and the money goes. It comes out of people's paychecks. It then it gets invested into mutual funds uh, and grows over time. They also are involved with processing the actual checks for distributions, right? If there are loans in your plan that are requested, they also process the distributions and checks for those. Nova is actually purely a compliance specialist. So I kind of think of us sort of like the CPAs to the plan. Uh, we keep you in compliance with all of the IRS regulations, of which there are many, and we'll go into a few in this presentation. But uh, there's also a legal plan document that we, we keep up to date that's required by every plan that spells out what the specific provisions of your plan are uh, and what all the rules are that that plan has to follow. Uh, we also um, prepare all the annual non-discrimination testing. There's also a filing with the Department of Labor that's similar to a tax filing that's be, you know, sent in every year. We prepare that. And so basically we're a consulting company that keeps you out of trouble with the IRS effectively. So, and then finally, uh, neither our firm nor the investment provider can actually provide specific investment advice to your participants if they have or need help. And so your financial advisor uh, will come into play for that. They'll help coordinate enrollment meetings and then if, if people need help and how to allocate their assets or have questions about the investments uh, and, and what might suit them the best, they can, they can contact the financial advisor. So these plans are highly regulated by two agencies, the IRS and the Department of Labor. And uh, because they give not only the plan sponsor, but the individuals who participate in the plan, uh, preferential tax treatment, there are quite a few rules that they make the plans follow. Okay, uh, and all of these rules are there to essentially protect the employees. So there are actually several non-discrimination tests that our firm has to run for all the 401k plans that we administer or help uh, consult with. Uh, we're only going to be talking about two of them, the ADP and the ACP test. Uh, um, and again, we'll get into some definitions here, but there are other tests, the top heavy tests, there's coverage testing. Uh, there's the 401A4 is te a test that's run if you're um, allocating a profit sharing style of contribution. Um, we're not going to go into those today, but just be aware that uh, there are quite a few non discrimination tests, and all of them uh, test a different aspect of the plan um, and make sure essentially that the, the highly compensated employees are not benefiting disproportionately more than the non-highly compensated employees. So a little terminology, because we'll uh, be using some acronyms later in this uh, presentation, but HCE stands for highly compensated employee, NHCE stands for non-highly compensated employee, ADP stands for the average deferral percentage test. Okay, so that's the one we're gonna be talking about today. And QNEC stands for Qualified Non-Elective Employer Contribution, which is a very specific type of corrective employer contribution that can be funded to the plan to possibly solve uh, an ADP test failure and prevent refunds from having to be made. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about how that works a little bit later. So you get a common question we get from participants, especially highly compensated ones all the time, is that they don't understand why they can't contribute the absolute maximum by law that's allowable in a 401k plan, which for 2024 is $23,000 if you're under age 50. It's actually $30,500 if for people that are 50 or older this year. Um, but they don't understand, you know, the highlights are limited by some of this testing that we have to uh, prepare and are, it's mandated by the government. Um, and that's why they cannot always put in the maximum. So it's this ADP test that limits them. So what is it? It's essentially a participation test that's looking to make sure that the plan does not discriminate in favor of the highly compensated employees with regard to the employee contribution rates. Okay, so their employees are having money taken out of their paychecks, 
it goes into the plan and each of them are contributing at different rates, right? Uh, so we're talking about the employee contributions when we talk about this test. And if there's too much of a discrepancy between the contributions that the highly compensated employees are putting in versus the non-highly compensated employees, then we have to fix it. We're required to fix it. And that fix can take several different forms. Uh, the most common one is that money gets refunded back to some of the highly compensated employees. Okay. Another way that uh, it can be fixed is the employer can choose um, on a discretionary basis to put more employer money into the plan to make the, the test pass. And again, we'll talk a little bit about how that works a little later. Uh, or it could be a combination of refunds and these QNICs, as we call them. So let's talk about how the test actually works, okay? Because there's several steps and we'll go through each one so that you understand them. Uh, this is not super critical that you know exactly how it works, but uh, you know, sometimes participants are asking questions and if you can explain it to them, at least in, in basic terms, um, you know, it could be useful for you. But I think for you to understand why this is happening uh, and how it works is important as well. So. So first we have to determine which employees are actually part of this test, okay? So the test is run on an annual or a plan year basis. Most plan years are calendar years. Um, so this test has to be run every year and all the employees who are eligible to participate or to contribute in the plan are included in the test. It's not just the people who are contributing. So if they're eligible, it's going to include the contributors and all the people that might be putting in zero, even though they elected to put in zero, right? Um, so it also includes anybody that terminated at any time during the year. So if you are eligible at any point during the year, you're in this test. That's why at the end of each year, NOVA comes to you and asks you for your full census for the entire year, right? Basically, you're your payroll record, you know, what were, what were the gross compensations that everybody made? What were the total contributions that everybody put into the plan? Okay, so everyone eligible in a particular year is in this test. So we then divide this population of people, this annual population, into two groups, highly compensated employee group and a non-highly compensated employee. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what is a highly compensated employee? in just a moment. So a highly compensated employee for this year, 2024, is any individual who made more than a certain threshold amount in the prior year. So for 24, anybody that grossed, this is not their salary, this is their actual earnings, the gross earnings in 2023, anybody that made more than $150,000 is a highly compensated employee. In addition to that, if there are any direct owners of the company who are working at the company, they are going to be in this test no matter what they make. The owner could be taking 50,000 in salary. If they're a greater than 5% owner, they're a highly paid person, according to the rules. Any family member, like a spouse, a grandparent, a child, you know, basically lineal descendants of the direct owner are also captured as highly compensated employees, okay? And, and compensation in this regard does not matter. So long as they're working at the company uh, and they're related to the direct owner, they're a highly compensated employee, all right? Everyone else is a non-highly compensated employee and the IRS does index this threshold, this $150,000 threshold from year to year. Like uh, for the year that you, that you might have failed, which was 2023, uh, anybody that made more than, I think it was 135 in 2022 was highly paid. So, so it does tend to increase over time, but some years it'll stay the same. It's, it's all indexed based on the inflation rate in the United States. So just keep that in mind. 
So we then have to calculate the percentage of compensation that each person is putting into the plan or having deducted from their pay, right? So, for example, if, if you have an individual who is putting in 10,600 in pre-tax money, and maybe they've also, they're also putting in 5,000 in Roth employee money, or they're having that deducted from their paycheck, uh, and they're making $130,000 a year, you, you add the two types of employee contributions together, divided by the compensation to come up with what is their actual individual rate. And your payroll systems, just so you know, you know, should if, if you've got both types of employee contributions, you want both of those fields, if they're separate fields within your payroll system, to be added together to determine what the total contribution is on a pay period by pay period basis, and then divide that by the the gross pay for each pay period to determine the amount to put in, right? Or or it's divided by the gross pay normally the employee is going to tell you, hey, take 10 or 12% out of my pay, right? That 12% should uh, uh, be taken out of the gross pay. And you're always adding the two pre-tax and Roth deferrals together. We then have to average the deferral rates for the two groups. So, right, we split the company into highly and non-highly compensated employees. We've calculated their each person's individual rate. We now have to come up with an average. So, for example, if we have a small company and we have two highly compensated employees and John is putting in 12% and David puts in zero, the average for the group is 6%. You, know, you come up with the total deferral rate and divide by the number of people in the group to come up with the average. Similarly, in the non-highly compensated, we've got one person putting in six, other one is at zero, so that average is 3%. Now, our systems do all of this for us when you give us the data. We then have to compare the average deferral rates for each group. Okay, so the general rule is there cannot be more than a two percentage point spread between the averages. Right. Again, this is a, this whole concept of the IRS does not want the highly compensated employees to benefit disproportionately more than the non highlies. And what, in their opinion, is getting out of line is when the highlies are more than two percent higher on average than the non highlies. There's a little caveat that if you, you know, if you've got really low rates of participation, they'll allow. Um, you to multiply by two instead of add two percentage points to figure out what the maximum for the highlights is. But generally speaking, it's easier to think about it like a two percentage point spread, okay? So in our previous example, right, we had the highly compensated group at 6% and the non-highly compensated group at 3%, right? That's a 3% spread. And so in that particular example, the plan was failing the average deferral percentage test because the spread was too high. So we had a failing test. Now we have to cure or, or correct the failure. That's the last step. So there's, uh, like I said, there's a way, a, a couple of different ways you can actually solve the problem. Uh, the most typical one is you refund enough money back to the highlies so that you get that spread down to within two percentage points. Okay, and I'll, I'll actually show you some examples of how that works as well. Um, but, you know, when you have a failing ADP test, you either have to refund money, you can put a plan limit in, I'll go into that, that's a solution that's not retroactive. So once you failed, you know, plan limits are not an option, but as part of your plan design that we'll discuss here in, in a moment, we could put something in your plan features in your in your plan document that could mitigate the the issue of having to issue refunds. You know, um, but basically, you're either returning money, or you've got to find some way to increase the participation. You know, get that average for the non-highly compensated employees up. Right. And a lot, a lot of times we recommend really 
doing a lot more educational meetings with your, your rank and file people to get them interested and or excited about contributing to the plan. Um, there is one alternative that once you're failing and you don't want to do refunds, you can actually make an additional employer contribution to the plan that's counted like an employee count contribution in this test. That's what a QNEC is. So if you give everybody one or 2% of pay that's eligible, um, you can count that 1% in your test and it, it raises the average, right? Because what's bringing down the average in this test? It's all the zero contributors. As you can see in the example before, right? I mean, one person put in 12, one put in zero, and it cut the rate in half. So if you can get rid of some of the zeros, you can improve the test, right? The other solution where you don't have to worry about any of this kind of testing, where you get an automatic pass, is called a safe harbor plan. We'll go into some of those designs in a moment. So how uh, do, you know, what happens when we have to refund money? So the refunds are taxable in the year the refund is made. So we just finished doing all your testing for 2023. Uh, so long as we got the refunds done by March 15th, basically two and a half months after the plan you're in, most plan years are calendar. So your December 31, 2023 plan you're in, the deadline was March 15th, which is why we tend to send out a lot of harassing emails saying, hey, we need your data and we need it pretty quick because we're trying to avoid a 10% penalty that would apply if we refunded money after that deadline. So you can still refund and fix the problem, but once you're past March 15th, now the company, not the individual, but the company has to pay it a penalty. All right. Uh, but even though we're refunding money that was contributed in 2023, the refunds are taxable in the year distributed so that no one has to go back. And if somebody filed their taxes early, they don't have to go back and refile their, their 2023 return if they happen to just get it done super early. Um, also, the refunds go back to the highly compensated employees who contributed the, the most in terms of dollars the highest dollar amount. I'll show you how that works in just a moment. Um, and then there's an adjustment for catch up. So the, the catch up contributions for people that are age 50 or older this year or even last year, right? It was $7,500 extra that could be put into the plan. Um, those catch ups are not counted in the test. So it's just the, you know, if somebody maxed out at $30,500. Uh, we would remove the $7,500, they would, they would be back at 23 and we'd count 23 in the test. We'll go through some examples. So, so who gets again, how, how does this refund process work and who gets it? So it is a two-step process. First, the refund amount is calculated based on the, the individuals who contribute the highest percentage. I'll show you an example in a moment. But, so the people that contribute the highest percentage will cause the problem potentially, but the money gets refunded back to the HCE who contributed the highest dollar amount. It doesn't sound like that would be intuitive, but I think the IRS here is, is, is their rationale is we feel that the highly compensated employees that put in the most money in terms of dollars got the most benefit out of the plan. And so if we're going to hurt somebody, we should hurt them first. Okay. So what does that look like? If we have, let's say there's just three highly compensated employees in the plan. Again, we're, we're, we're figuring out the individual ADP rates, right? Their individual contribution rates by just taking the amount they contributed, dividing it by their total gross pay to come up with the, um, percentage that they each put in. So step one is the refunds in this case are being calculated based on the people that put in the highest contribution rate. So these two at the highest rate at 10% and 11, the initial refund amount is calculated to reduce these guys back to a level that the test would pass. 
I haven't given all the detail, but let's assume that if we refunded this amount of money, they'd be within the two percentage point spread, right? It's not an individual spread, it's an average, right? But um, so the initial, this, this 6,500 is calculated and created by the guys that create, that had the highest percentage. However, in this example, all of that refund money, that 6,500 goes back to John. Why? Because he put in the highest dollar amount, which doesn't seem fair, right? There, there are solutions to this, but that's what the IRS thinks is fair. I think, again, they're, they're thinking, look, Steve and David made less money. They put in less contribution, even though they caused the problem. We're going to go back and, and hurt this guy because he got the best you got the best benefit out of the plan. I'm, I'm sure that's what their rationale is. I don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, that's just the way it is. So. Now, one way you can actually compensate or, or adjust for this in your plan document would be to put in what we call a formal plan limit, meaning you know, you've got this legal plan document that governs all the rules of your plan, and you can actually put a provision in that document that says, that um, I'm gonna limit the highly compensated to a certain percent, 5%, 6%, whatever, right? Um, you can actually do that. And so what that does is um, it's going to, you know, it's gonna limit the people that are putting in those high percentage amounts, and by people, I mean the highly compensated employees that are putting in the high percentage amounts, it's going to limit them so that they don't create the refund for the, the person that put in the low, it had, had the highest dollar, basically a situation I just showed you, right? Um, so effectively, you, you now are limiting and or, I, I use the word hurt, I, maybe that's not the proper word, but you're hurting the guys that are creating the problem, you know? I mean, they're gonna get limited to 7%. So in an example, well, hold on, I'll show you the example in a minute. So formally limiting them results in the best possible treatment of the catch-ups as well, right? So just getting a little bit in the weeds here, but you'll see it in a, in a visual example, I think it'll make sense. So um, we think of catch-ups uh, as that extra $7,500 that gets, that people can put in once they're 50. Um, and we're always thinking about it in terms of the limit for the employee contribution, that $23,000 limit, you know, so a catch-up is anything over that amount, right? But in reality, in the regulations, a catch-up can be created whenever any IRS limit for any of these other tests is surpassed, or if you have a formal plan limit in your plan, like we're discussing, right? So what that looks like is this. So in this example, right, we have limited, let's say we have a 7% limit in our plan document. So that means that we're gonna limit all three highly to 7% and call anything that's over that a catch up, right? So th these are the total actual amounts that went into the plan. And the, the, you can see uh, as a percentage of pay, these guys are pretty high. But if we limit them, they're down to 7% and we've lowered our average for this group. Not only that, I don't have to count, I don't have to count these catch-ups in my test in this column, right? So it's just a way to bring people that are contributing at a high rate, highly compensated that are at a high rate, down to a level where they don't cause a problem for John, right? Because if I'm John and I'm the owner, I'm like, why am I getting a refund when my other lower highly paid people are creating the problem for me? You know, so maybe as an owner, I don't want to, I don't like that result. I put in the plan limit, I can, I can fix it or, or get a more equitable result, shall we say. Okay, so additional contributions, the QNEX that we talked about involve, as I described before, putting in a percent of pay, not only for the contributors, but you know, it's gonna involve potentially putting in 
a percent of pay for even people that didn't contribute and counting it as an employee contribution to reduce the zeros that you're in that are in your plan and then bring bring the average of the non highlies up to a, an acceptable level most companies don't go with this option because it can be relatively expensive um, and the money that goes in is 100% vested immediately, meaning uh, any vesting schedule you have on your plan uh, will not apply to this kind of a corrective contribution. So we have a few plans every year that will, will go this method. If, if basically you're, you're putting in a contribution in 2024 that makes the plan pass so that refunds don't have to be issued. Um, and we only see plans use this method if, if the cost is relatively reasonable compared to the amount of refund that has to be returned. Like if, if you had a big plan and maybe a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars of refunds are going back to many highly compensated employees, and I can solve the problem with a qualified non-elective contribution of fifty thousand, maybe it's worth it to a company, right? To put in the money and, and not have to refund the money. Okay, but it is an option. The only other thing you can do if you're failing, well, there's a couple of things, but one of the things you can do if you're failing a test is to try and increase participation of the non-highlies, right? We, there's only two ways to do this. You either have to bring the highly compensated average down or bring the non-highly compensated average up somehow within this two percentage point spread. So we always recommend to clients, if you have not had educational meetings with your employees to, to help them understand the benefits of contributing to a tax qualified plan um you know i would definitely go that route your investment advisor can help you uh, conduct some of those meetings and you know they they understand all the time value of money concepts of saving over a long period of time uh in a tax deferred environment they, they can they can show lots of graphics about how much even putting in a small amount today for young people can grow to when they're 65. Other things that can be done to again spur participation, how you get people to want to contribute, you might want to restructure your matching contribution formula or maybe even start one if you're not making a match at all, right? A match is an employer contribution that goes into the plan only for people that contribute. So if you put in, Mr. Participant, if you put in $100, I'll put in $50, right? So you're, you're incentivizing individuals to contribute by giving them what amounts to basically free money, right? Um, there's also a type of plan feature called automatic enrollment, where if you if you put this feature in your plan and you're offering the plan to new enrollees, anybody that does not make an affirmative election, it could be a certain percentage or it could be even zero, but they have to make an affirmative election of something. If they don't, like people are asleep at the wheel when you offer them the plan, your plan document would say you're going to get automatically enrolled or, you know, we're putting a deduction to your paycheck for 3% or 5% or you can choose the percentage as an, as a, an employer, but you're, you're forcing people into the plan at a certain rate if they don't respond to your request to make an affirmative election. And under those automatic enrollment plans, you can also have a little step up features in your plan that say, okay, we're going to start at 3%, and each year, all these people that were automatically enrolled, we're going to automatically increase them by 1% every year, up to some maximum, you know. And again, what are we doing? We're, we're getting as many of the zeros in our plan to not be a zero anymore, and you have to be 1, 3, 5%, right? And that brings your average up. So an example of restructuring and matching formula, I see this all the time in plans, right? Uh, uh, a plan might have a formula that's dollar for dollar on the first 3% that an employer uh, or that the employee puts in, right? And from a cost perspective, the exact same amount of money will be spent if your formula was 50 cents on the dollar on the first 6% that they put in, right? Because the first formula is incentivizing people to put in 3%, and the second one that doesn't cost any more out of pocket for your company incentivizes them to put in 6%. So the more the non highlies you know, the higher the rate is, the better your average is going to be. So 
you want you want a, a formula that incentivizes people to put in more of their own money. And most of the formulas in plans are discretionary, right? So you can you can come up with a whole variety of formulas. Uh, maybe maybe your your company never thought about it this way, and and just could restructure your discretionary formula into something else that incentivizes people more. So. Now, safe harbor plan is a type of plan design and a specifically a type of employer contribution that if you agree to make it for an entire year, it is a year to year election, but if you commit to it for one year, at least, you know, for that particular year, you are exempt from the ADP test. All right. So there's two types. There's a matching variety and a non-elective variety, a kind of a profit sharing variety. So under the match, the, the minimum formula that you have to comply with and stick to for an entire year is dollar for dollar on the first 3% that somebody puts in and then 50 cents on the dollar on the next 2%. So this formula, you know, somebody puts in at least 5% uh, of pay, they're going to get a 4% match, right? It only goes to the people who are contributing. That is the key concept for a match. I'm going to match what you put in to some extent. Safe Harbor non-elective doesn't do that. It will give the minimum amount is 3% of total gross pay to everyone that's eligible, whether they're contributing or not. Okay, so they just have to be eligible to contribute to get this particular contribution. Now, both styles, I mean, you're gonna, you're giving up, so like the IRS is not going to give you something that exempts you from the testing without some cost, right? Number one, the formulas, depending on how big your company is and who's contributing, can be relatively expensive, right? Um, they also have to, all these dollars are 100% vested immediately. So unlike a discretionary match, where you can apply a vesting schedule, meaning, you know, if you've got a six year graded schedule, you know, somebody's only, you know, after two years of service, they're only 20% vested. So if they leave at two years, you know, you're gonna, your company's gonna recoup 80% of the dollars you put in on the match, okay? That's not true of a safe harbor contribution. It's 100% vested immediately. Now, if you switch over to safe harbor, that doesn't mean that all of your old matching money that was discretionary now has to be 100% vested. That is not, you know, th this money is going into different little line items and buckets uh, at your investment provider. If you switch over to Safe Harbor, they create a new line item called Safe Harbor Match. The new dollars go in there, right? And those are 100% vested. Everything else that you've put in in the past continues to vest under the, the vesting schedule that you have. So there's also a, what we call a QUACA, Qualified Automatic Contribution Arrangement. This is the safe harbor version of an automatic enrollment plan. So again, people that do, do not make an affirmative election of some kind get forced into the plan at a certain rate, okay? Um, the safe harbor formula for this type of a plan is 100% of the first 1% someone puts in and then 50% on the next five. So it's a little bit cheaper if you do the math this one caps out at three and a half percent instead of four, right? So if somebody puts in at least 6% of their pay, they're gonna get a three and a half percent match. The safe harbor not elective variety is the same. It's three, 3%, three 3% of pay, all right? The one other advantage you get here other than the cheaper formula is that you can apply a very short vesting schedule to these safe harbor contributions. So it's a cliff vest schedule that says that They've got to be 100% after two years, but if somebody leaves under two years, you know, you can recoup the money as a company. So they don't get to take it all with them. So what do I do if I want to make a safe harbor plan switch? You can, it, it, it is a, for the matching variety, right? It, 
it's a prospective election. You, you cannot switch mid-year. We're in 2024 right now. You cannot go safe harbor match for 2024. It's just against the rules. Uh, you can do it for beginning 2025, right? And it's a one-year commitment. Um, and Nova really would need to, to have a decision made, ideally, by November 1st, if not earlier. Right, because uh, there are systems changes. We've got to amend your plan document. There, there are things that need to be done from an administrative perspective that take a little bit of time to make the change, and we can't all be doing it in December. So, um, if you're thinking about possibly going safe harbor, let us know sooner rather than later, but certainly no later than November 1st. Now, a uh, recent rule change, it used to be that you could not uh, elect the 3% non-elective safe harbor mid-year either. And the SECURE Act that was passed uh, two or three years ago changed this rule. And now it is permissible if you're in the middle of a year to make a safe harbor non-elective election mid-year. So the way that works is, again, if let's say you want to be safe harbor for 2024, you would need to let us know by November 1st that you want to be safe harbor for this year. And you, you would be on the hook for the 3% contribution on the full year's worth of compensation. I mean, if you decide in July, you don't get to just give 3% of pay from the time you make that election to the end of the year for half the year. I mean, it, it is gonna be based on the full year's worth of comp and you'd have to contribute the 3%. Normally, these types of plans, NOVA does the calculation for you after the year closes, right? Because it's based on total pay and we don't know what everybody's total pay is until the last W-2 pay, pay period closes out. You can actually go safe harbor retroactive to the prior year as well. So, for example, now, you know, why, why would an employer want to do this? Let, let's say that we were running your testing in February and you had a very bad failure and you felt you'd rather be safe harbor so you don't have to make the refunds at all. You could make an election to be safe harbor retro to 2023 uh, and then not have to refund the money. Now, the one extra cost to that is that if you're going, if you're going safe harbor retroactive to the prior year, you have to make a 4% contribution. The cost goes up, but it, it can be done. This was never available three years ago. So some other things that we can help maybe mitigate or at least give you an idea whether you have a problem in any particular year or would anticipate a problem is what we call mid-year testing. This is not a required, all the other tests that I've described and that we talked about at the beginning, um, those are all required tests by the IRS. This is, this is almost like taking, this is a mid-year test where we just take your year-to-date data, we being NOVA, and we'll extrapolate it and annualize it and then run a kind of a mock test using your data so far this year, for example, to give you some idea, do I expect to pass this year? Do I think I'm gonna have a failure? What do the refunds, what's an, a good estimate for how much I would expect in refunds so that, you know, you can go to your highly compensated employees and go, look, we are expecting a failure. I mean, you can either keep putting in the amounts that you're putting in now and you'll just get some of it back next year or, um, you can adjust your rates lower if you want, but you know, you, you get to talk to people ahead of time and, and give them the heads up, right? Um, just be on the lookout. So this is optional. It, there is additional, we, we charge for this. Um, I wanna say for a smaller plan is $750 to run this test, uh, maybe a thousand for a larger plan, uh, but, but there is a cost to it. It is optional. Uh, but if you feel it would help you uh, in your communications to your your people, um, let us know. We, we will we will be sending out emails about this around the middle of the year, and you can just respond to those if 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 it's a service you want. 
The other thing mid-year testing can help with is there are ways to change the testing methods, again, without getting into all the boring details of how we run the test. We can use different methods of testing that are described in your legal plan document, but if we're gonna change them, the unfortunate part is we don't get to change them uh, after the year closes. We can actually change them mid-year. So if we do a mid-year test and we wanna, you know, part of what we would do is run your test a few different ways to see if there's an advantage one way or the other in some of these testing methods. And if there is, we would let you know and go, hey, we think you should change your method to this and we can amend your plan right now to do it. That wouldn't be available after 1231. So um, there are some advantages to mid-year testing. Uh, if you happen to have the highly compensated employee rule that I described before that says that you make more than 150 in the prior year, you're highly paid. There is an extra little rule called this top paid election. If more than 20% of your company, of your eligibles, right, make more than the 150, you can actually limit, you can put additional limits on who you consider highly paid to the top 20%. So let's say half my company makes more than 150,000. Um, I could pick the top 20%. I, I don't have to put all 50% of them in, you know, if that makes sense. So, um, Please make sure that uh, you're updating your, your plan limits and payroll. Uh, we sent out some communications uh, at the end of last year. The IRS indexes a lot of these limits every year. Uh, and we send out communications usually in December. But just to recap, the if you're under age 50, the maximum limit this year is $23,000. And you should have that input as a cutoff in your payroll system, right? If somebody is 50 years or older, their limit is higher, it's 30,500. Again, make sure you've got the right limiters in your payroll system so that we don't have to fix it after the fact, right? which, which we can do. We do find people that go over these limits. Also, this is an important one. The maximum compensation, as we mentioned, is $345,000. So even if I have a person or an owner that makes a million dollars, all we can count for all testing purposes and contribution rate purposes in the plan is $345,000. What that effectively does is it creates a limit on your match as well if you're making one. Some plans, you know, all of your plans were tested, so that means you didn't have any required matching contributions. Um, but whatever contributions, matching contributions you may have made, are subject to a limit. And the way you figure out what your individual plan limit is, is you take your formula, whatever the maximum percentage is, multiply that by the 345 to come up with the limit. So for example, if I have a 100% up to 4% formula, I take 4% of 345 and I come up with 13,800. That means no person in your plan should ever get more than $13,800 in match under that formula. Another popular formula is 50% up to six. That means that formula caps out at 3%. So I take 3% times 345 and I come up with 10,350. So um, keep that in mind in, in terms of your payroll and when you cut people off. We have seen plans that do it wrong. You cut people off when they hit the dollar limit, 13,800 for example. You don't cut people off when they get to the 345,000th dollar, right? The minute they get to 345, that's not when you cut the match off. Cut them off when they hit the dollar amount, okay? I think that's it. I don't know if we have questions, uh, you know, as, as uh, if you do, you can contact me directly or your account manager if you know their number. Uh, as Yvette, mentioned we do have recordings of all of our other webinars that you might be interested in at our YouTube channel. And if you want to register for any more live sessions like this one, you can also register it uh, at, uh, on the website listed. So Yvette, do we have any questions at this point? We do not have any questions. Um, so I'll just go over a couple of reminders uh, before we close out. Um, uh, on your go-to panel, you're going to see a drop-down for handouts. Um, we did get some messages uh, saying they were not able to 
retrieve the PDF that was uploaded, um, go ahead and email webinars at novo401k.com and we can go ahead and send you the PDF version of the presentation. <clears throat> um, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and email Steve or you can email webinars at novo401k.com and we can forward those over to him. Um, for CE credit, please be sure to fill out the pop-up survey once the session ends. Um, to view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova for All 1K Associates, or you can visit our website, which is wwwnova 1 kcom backslash webinars. Thank you so much, Steve, for uh, sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. And thanks again to everybody for joining. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.